invite the rest of us, both online and here in person, if you turn in your scriptures, whether you have a Bible like I do this morning, or you got an app on your phone, as long as you're using that app and not some other app, right? <laughs> Romans chapter 11, there we go, Romans 11, verses 25 through 32. We sang a song just a moment ago that has such a depth and a richness to it. Think with me of what you and I are looking at in glory, the one who's seated on the throne. There's something of earth in heaven in that the Lamb of God, whom all of heaven cries out, worthy, holy, glory, the Lamb of God has the marks of his crucifixion. And for all of eternity, they will be present on him reflecting his great love for us, that he so loved the world, he offered himself in our place. The marks of the cross for all of eternity on display to say such is the greatness of our Father's love, that jealous God that Phil spoke of just a moment ago. As we prepare to look in God's word, would you pray with me? Father, how great is this love expressed to us in Christ and that, Father, you would bring heaven to us. You would bring righteousness to us. Your great love opened the way. We thank you that that's true this morning. Lord, I pray that the words of my lips, the meditation of our hearts together as we look to your word, God, it would be pleasing to you and that you would be free to speak to us and mold and shape us and grant us hearts of faith and celebrate this incredible rescue plan, this salvation that came through Christ. We thank you in his name. Amen. August 5th, 2010, about two in the afternoon, half a mile beneath the Atacama Desert in Chile, a mine shaft collapsed. The San Jose gold and copper mine suffered a major cave-in. The mine's been in operation since 1889, long time. There have been other collapses in the past. In fact, back in 2007, there'd been an explosion that took place deep in the mine. Three miners died at that time. But the mine was allowed to get back up to production and go back into what it normally does. And perhaps there was a profit over safety margin showing in what took place. But in that major cave-in that took place in 2010, 33 miners were trapped that distance deep down in this mountain, straight down. Just think straight down a half mile. And they're trapped. 32 are Chilean, one is Bolivian. Nobody can reach them. Search and rescue goes in. They're trying to get to them. They cannot. It's totally blocked. There's no way to get there at that time. More advanced, skilled rescuers are brought in. And then on the seventh, there's another cave in. And so the ventilation shaft that they're hoping to use as a way to reach these trapped miners um, could no longer be used. And now they're struggling because the search and rescue folks, they have outdated maps. They really, they have a sense of where they are, but they're not sure where they are. And there's no way to communicate. And a lot of time goes by. The only thing they can do is to bring in some uh, drills and begin to drill down into that mine to try and angle uh, a rescue line in such a way where they can put listening devices down. And so they proceed to do that. There's 30 different holes being drilled a half a mile down into that mountain to try to listen. Did anybody survive? There's 15 days that passed and not a word has been heard, but they're drilling. And they send listening probes down. And at some point on that 15th day, one of those probes, there was something they were hearing. It sounded like tapping. And they lifted the probe. And attached in the end of the probe was a short note. I, I don't speak well Spanish, so forgive me, right? Estamos bien en el refugio 
Lost 33. Translation, you need that. All 33 of us are all right. We're in the shelter. All 33 miners, everybody, safe in a shelter. But it's been 15 days. The shelter has food for two days. It has limited access for water. But because they're able to understand that they were there and they're able to pass this note back and forth, shortly thereafter, the rescuers are able to then, through that same hole, uh, put down some uh, food and some water and some communication tools and things like that. It's 96 degrees down there. Remember, the closer to the heart of the earth you are, the hotter it gets. And so it's 96 degrees. They're in total darkness. They're trapped. There's still no way to them. Now what? This real event took place again 14 years ago, and the rescuers came up with this plan. We're going to try three different ways to reach them. And so they set up three different drilling rigs to cut through 2,300 feet of solid rock. Uh, Two were small uh, raised bore grills where you drill a small hole through, which is what they've done the listening device through, drill a small hole and then follow up with a bigger hole behind it. And the third one was a large wide bore that would drill a single hole. The plan A, the first drill started drilling on August 29th. The second drill, plan B, from a different angle, September the 5th. Plan C started on September the 19th. You catch the time? Time's ticking. It's been a long time. They're in communication with the 33. They're letting them know we're coming. The rescue's happening. We're just trying to create this way to reach you. And their expectation was it's going to be late December before we get to them. Plan A, plan B, plan C. Plan B, that drill breaks through an unexpected access chamber. And as it broke through that access chamber, the recognition was we can reach them from here. It's 250 feet above them, but we should be able to reach them from here. And so they'd been, um, they have a rescue pod, and they'd be lining that shaft with metal so there would be no further cave-ins. And so what did it take? One rescue worker had to get in the pod and go down to reach them. That was a must. There was no other way. Had to take the pod down and let them know that rescue had come. And then they had to be willing to get in the pod to leave. And oh, by the way, it's one at a time. Right? There's no other way out of the cave. No other way out of that mine. October the 12th, a rescue worker was lowered. Went and found the miners. Can you imagine what happened at that moment? And then slowly escorted them to where they needed to be, and they began to come to the surface, one after another after another. The president of Chile was there. In the evening of the 13th, uh, October the 13th, later that evening, the last of the 33 were saved. Lost 33. All saved. Every single one. And you can see the look on their faces. And the family and the friends and the search and rescue workers and everybody's around there. You know they had a camp right next to the mine? It was called Camp Hope. And the, the, the eyes of the world were on Chile at that time. And I, I remember hearing about this and thinking to myself, oh my goodness, to be trapped for 69 days in those conditions, complete darkness, heat, lack of food, lack of communication, lack of any, and there's no way out unless someone drills a way to you. And then each one is rescued and saved. When you and I look at Romans chapter 11, the Apostle Paul makes a statement. He says this in verse 26, all Israel will be saved. All Israel will be saved. Paul wants the church to understand the God that we serve, this God who has sent Christ, the Savior, to us. His desire is that all would be saved. And you remember Jesus told the story of the 99 sheep, and what does he do? He chases the one that's missing because he wants all 100, not not just 99. He wants all to be with him. 
And Christ modeled that tremendously. So as Paul is writing in Romans chapter 11, remember he's helping the church to come to grips with and understand why it is that so many Jewish people, Israelite people, are so far from God still because they've rejected Messiah. They're still looking for Messiah to come, and God's saying, I've sent him. And indeed, you crucified him. And yet it was part of a bigger plan. He's come. He's here. Place your trust in Jesus Messiah, the very Son of God, not only died on the cross, but rose again, proved that he's the very Son of God, and evidence that God's plan is working. Christ came and died with that in purpose, that he might rescue us and save every single one. And so he's sent to restore us to a right relationship with God. Romans 9 through 11 traces that theme. We, we've been there for a number of weeks, I know. And we've been slowly working our way through Romans chapter 11. And you remember with me last week that Paul takes us this metaphor of uh, an olive tree, which was symbolic of Israel, and says, remember that, that God is grafting us into the tree. As we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we're made part of the tree and the life that's in the roots of the tree, which is Christ himself, that life flows through us. But Paul says, there's, remember, there's two types of branches in this tree. There's the wild branches and the natural branches. And so the wild branches represent all the nations of the world except Israel. The natural branches represent Israel itself because God said, I chose my people from amongst the nations. I called this one and raised it up. And yet through this one, through Abraham, through his descendants, will come the one, the root of Jesse, the Messiah. And through him comes salvation. God's rescue plan is still unfolding. That's what Paul's trying to tell us. As you read here, Paul's inviting us to remember again that when Messiah came, he came to his own, John 1, verse 11, but his own would not receive him. They wouldn't accept him. And God said, I know that that's how it's going to play out because I know the hearts of people. And so there were those that through the prophets, God said, they're, they're going to reject him. And because they've rejected the Messiah, God says, I'm going to pivot and I'm going to bring good news to the non-Jewish people to those wild branches and I'm going to share that gospel good news of grace through Christ with those that are willing to respond in faith but I've not forgotten my people I've not forgotten Israel Israel matters we heard about this word jealous he's jealous for his name he's jealous for his people and he's made a covenant to rescue all from Sin, all who will believe. So remember with me, Paul made this, this comparison in verse 24, and he says there, listen, if, if you Gentiles, as wild branches, if you could be grafted into this tree, it isn't hard for the Lord Almighty God to regraft Israel back into the tree if they will put their trust in Jesus as Messiah. That's where we left off, Right? So God's rescue plan is still unfolding. So we get to verse 25, and Paul says this. I, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you would not be uh, uh, conceited. There's nothing to be boasting about, but there's a mystery that's unfolding here because God initiated this rescue plan. It involves his son. Nobody saw it coming in one sense. The prophet said it would. But most people were oblivious to that. It was a mystery to them. And yet Paul says, I want you to understand, we've got nothing to boast about as if somehow we're extra special because God raised up Israel or God spoke to you as a non-Jewish person and, and gave you grace and mercy when you deserve something else. There's nothing to boast about yourself. No, God has done it all. He's done all the heavy lifting. But look what he's done. This rescue operation, there's, there's mystery here. Paul says, let me pull back the curtain. Let me put the spotlight on God's mercy and grace. We just sing about his love that is so amazing. And it's amazing because it's steadfast, never ending, never, un, you know, it's just unlimited. And God is able to reach the lost, the trapped, those caught in darkness. So here's part of that mystery, Paul says. There's a partial hardening that has come upon Israel. You see that language in the text? That word hardening is a, a super important one for us to understand, isn't it? 
this partial hardening. And so think with me, as, as Paul says, when I went to a place, I went to the synagogue first. Remember how Romans 1 starts? Romans 1, about 16, it says, to the Jew first, then the Gentile. That was Paul's church planning plan, right? He'd show up in a community, find the Jewish community, spend time with them, worship with them, take them to the scriptures and show from the scriptures that Jesus is God's promised Messiah. There would be those who might believe. Acts chapter 13, we get kind of a picture of this, right? Luke is describing what's happening in Antioch. There were those who put their trust in Jesus. But then the rest of the Jewish people in that synagogue stirred up trouble, began to contradict. And how do Paul and Barnabas respond? Verse 46. It was necessary to speak the word of God to you first. But since you reject it and do not consider yourself worthy of eternal life, we turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. God's rescue plan, his salvation plan is unfolding. And Paul says, if you won't believe, these people will. And God says, I'm moving towards these people. And what's happened with Israel as a result? There's a hardening. Their hearts have become calloused. There's a rebelliousness. There's, there's an unwillingness to submit and acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. But notice it's a partial hardening. Do you catch that? The, the scripture doesn't say God hardened their hearts and it was just everybody. No. What's Paul saying? God has not fallen short on his promises. God is still able to save. He saved me. Paul says, here I am as an example of God's grace and mercy still to Jewish people. He rescued me. And there are other Jewish people that have responded in faith just like Paul. And so the season we live in now is one where there's a partial hardening of Israel. There are those Jewish people coming to faith in Christ. But the Gentile people have made up the majority of the church. Friends, we still live in that season. It's where we still live today. But God's not finished. There's more that's happening. Think about that mining disaster. It may look and feel like there's nothing else happening, but all that time there's a drill drilling away. And God's making a way. Notice here in the text where it says, this hardening continues until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. Do you notice it tells us a time? No, it doesn't. It just says until the full number comes in. Who knows when that is? The Father does. I know some of you are here this morning and um, perhaps in the past or maybe even right now, you know it's hunting season. And you know the start dates and ending dates, right? Best know those well before you go out. There's a start and there's a finish. I want you to notice that in the scriptures with regard to God's rescue plan, he doesn't give a specific date, time. But it is associated with the return of Christ. This gospel, the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all nations, Matthew 24, 14, and then the end will come. There's a connection here. And so Paul's pulling back the curtain, showing us this mystery that God has pivoted and where the Jewish people have turned away from God, the Gentile people are turning towards God. And so he's bringing them in and there will be a move of God amongst the Gentile people. But God is not finished with Israel. And so you get to verse 26 and it says, in this way, all of Israel will be saved. And God's saying that I'm true to my word. I made a covenant with Israel and I will bring Jewish people to be around this throne. It's my intent and my purpose. It started with Genesis 12, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And he said, what I promised, I will do. And so God promises that blessing that Israel itself will come to a place of salvation and trust in Christ. But let's ask the question, what does Paul mean when he says all Israel? Ask the question. Does he mean that everybody living within the geographic boundaries of Israel, the nation Israel that we know today? Does, does he mean all the people that live within those boundaries and all the Jewish people who live wherever they might live in the world today? Is that what the scripture is saying? Or is it saying something else? So God's word tells us that uh, if we're going to understand his word, we need to let scripture interpret scripture. We need to take wisdom from God's word where he's revealing some things to help us understand. So right in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 9, Paul 
had been talking about his great desire that his people would come to faith in Jesus just as he had. In Romans 9 and verse 6, he says this, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Right? Not all are children of Abraham just because they are his offspring. So just because you have a Jewish birth certificate and passport doesn't mean that you're a true Israelite. That's what the scriptures say. Rather, it has something to do with faith and belief and trust and obedience to God. And if you go to Romans chapter 2 and verse 29, Paul says this, A person is a Jew who is one inwardly. And the circumcision is a circumcision of the heart by the spirit and not by the written code. And so when Paul says all Israel will be saved, he's saying all those Jewish people who submit to Jesus Christ as Lord and acknowledge him by faith, they will be saved. Not one will be lost. They've been entrusted to the Father in that way. But they must believe even as you and I must believe and take God at his word. So when Paul says all will be saved, he's saying all those who hear the voice of the shepherd calling their name and they respond in faith. The Jewish people come to God the same way the non-Jewish people come to God. By faith, trust in God because he's graciously extended that invitation. Think with me about that a little bit more. Christ, the good shepherd, calling out to his people, telling them again, I'm still here. I want you with me. I've done everything possible that you might join me. And Christ still reaching out. The glory of God, the patience of God, the love of God, just as God declared through his prophets. Look with me. As the text goes on, it says this, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. This will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Paul is quoting from Isaiah 27 and verse 9, Isaiah 59, verses 20 through 21. And in all of those things, he's declaring this, that salvation comes through the Jewish people, comes through Zion. And God's sending his deliverer in that way. And the prophet Isaiah declared those things very, very strongly. You remember with me, Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman at the well, as they're discussing where will salvation come from, what does Jesus say? John 4, verse 22. Salvation comes from the Jews. It comes through the Jewish people. Jesus of Nazareth, fully man, fully God, fully Jewish, Messiah. Notice how this talks about the ungodliness of Jacob. I don't know about you, but I've wondered about this many times. Lord, you, when you got a hold of Jacob, everybody know the story of Jacob? Not necessarily, right? But here's, here's the nutshell story. Two boys, twins, born. Esau, the older, he gets out first, right? But there's competition between them right from birth. And Jacob is always trying to grab a hold of him and get ahead of him. And the story has Jacob with scheming and conniving, trying to grab something that's really not his, but he grabs Esau's birthright, but Esau despises the birthright and gives it away for a bowl of stew. And so these two brothers, always in competition, says, God loved Jacob. Esau he didn't care for only because Esau didn't care for God. Esau turned his back on God. But Jacob, it took years, but God faithfully worked in Jacob's life and changed him to the point where one day he could say to him, Jacob, that's not your name anymore. You've got a new name. Your name is Israel, the namesake of the nation that we call Israel today. So you've got Jacob, who's been transformed by the grace of God, and, and God has promised that he would remove sin. And how many times in the scriptures you've got the name Jacob used and then right next to it is an adjective that describes Jacob. Notice here it says ungodly. Uh, other times uh, it's words like rebellious, stubborn, stiff-necked, sinful, proud. It's reminding us about Jacob's old nature, who he used to be, and God says, I I made you someone else. And so when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will become all that I intended for you to be. And indeed, God says, I've made a new covenant 
that that might be true of my people of Israel and the non-Jewish people together all might be the same and that my sin, uh, the sin rather has been removed from you. So Jeremiah 31 verse 33, uh, the Lord says this, behold, the days are coming. I'm making a new covenant. It's with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law within them, write it on their hearts. I will forgive their iniquity and remember it no more. So this new covenant was not only Isaiah the prophet speaking that, but Jeremiah the prophet spoke the same thing. Later, as Israel's in Babylon in exile, Ezekiel says, this is what the Lord says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from your uncleanness and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. He says, I'm forgiving you. And by the way, if you read that text, if you want to do the study on jealous Check out Ezekiel 36, because God says, I'm not doing it about you, it's for the sake of my great name. I'm doing these things. Israel, set apart by God, desperately needing God, now in a point of partial hardening, and yet God says, I'm not finished with you. There will come a time when the fullness of the Gentiles have been entered in and a part of things. You will join by faith. In the meantime, what's true for the church? Verse 27. As far as the gospel is concerned, they're enemies. But as far as the election is concerned, they're beloved on account of the patriarchs. God says, yes, they're persecuting the church. Yes, it's difficult to represent Christ before them. There's hostility, there's accusation, there's jealousy. You read the book of Acts, you can see that over and over again. And friends, it's the same today. If you represent Jesus in Israel today, you'll get a pretty strong response from a lot of people, but it's not a friendly response. They're still looking for Messiah, and yet Messiah's already come. The good news is, he's come to rescue Jew and Gentile. He's committed to rescue both, all nations, all peoples represented on the throne. And so he's going to rescue his people And the Jewish people are still beloved and precious in God's sight. And we just want to hold on to that and not lose that. This is God's heart. He says, I'm drawing my people to myself. My rescue plan is still unfolding. And so Paul goes on in verse 28 and says, concerning the gifts and the calling of God, they're irrevocable. It's fascinating because that that sense of the calling of God, uh, it literally says God has not repented or that is, he's not had a change of mind. God's mind is set. He's still about rescuing his people as well as the other peoples of the world. And so he's committed to that. This is his salvation plan. And in light of that, there's the gifts and the calling. So think with me about the gifts of God. Romans 6 and verse 23, the wages of sin are death, but the free gift of God is salvation in Christ Jesus, right? The gift of his indwelling Holy Spirit that we might be witnesses, Acts chapter 1 and 2, where Paul, uh, Peter rather, is reminding people that what you see and hear is the Lord fulfilling his word, pouring out his spirit. And Jesus has said, I want you to wait that you might receive fullness from me. The fruit of God's spirit, Galatians 5, that changes us from the inside out and gives us the heart and mind of Christ and, and the gifting of Christ. God says these are the gifts and they're irrevocable. And I'm pouring those things out. And then there's his calling. And and again, his sheep know the voice of their Savior and they respond in faith to the good shepherd. Didn't Jesus say, many are called, but few are chosen? He says, I've called many, but who will respond with a heart of faith and trust? Not everyone. But there will be a few that do. And his sheep know his voice, and they respond in that way. And so Colossians 1 and verse 13 talks about the fact that uh, we've been transferred out of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. God said, this is the work that I'm doing. Isaiah 41, Israel, you're my servant. Jacob, whom I've chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, I've chosen you. I've not cast you off. I've, I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'm your God. You'll strengthen you. I will help you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. God says, I'm still working. And I want you with me. And I'm moving heaven and earth for that to happen. Think about those miners. Think about what God did. Psalm 89. 
I'll sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever with my mouth. I'll make known your faithfulness to all generations and say, I made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever. God says, I make a vow. I will rescue my people. And he always keeps his promise. Paul just continues to put this in front of us. This is the irrevocable nature of God's gift and call. And what is it that you and I need? Mercy. Do you deserve this? Do I deserve this? No, what we have coming to us are the wages of sin. That's what we've earned. And that's called judgment and justice. That's what we deserve. But the gift... The gift is grace. The gift is mercy. And so while we're rebels by nature and by choice, God extends mercy. We sang about it earlier today, didn't we? Look with me at verse 30. Just as you are at one time disobedient to God, but have now received mercy, this is written to the Gentile people, so too they, the Jewish people, have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. God's rescue plan is still unfolding. We deserve judgment, but we receive mercy. And his mercy is now offered freely to all because of who God is. Do you remember a story of Moses daring to say to God, show me your glory. I just want to see you for who you really are. And the scripture says that God placed his hand in front of Moses, said, you can only see my back, you can't see my face. But the Lord himself proclaimed and said, this is what's true about me. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. I remove it all from you by my grace. Mercy. Look at that last verse in Romans 11, 32. The Lord consigned all to disobedience so that he might have mercy on all. What's that saying? To be consigned means to be bound to. Is there anybody in this room that can say, I've lived a life free of rebellion against God. I've lived a life free of sin against God. I'm good just as I am. Everybody, are we okay? I better put my hand up. Right? True story. And the Lord says it's true of the non-Jewish people. Read Romans 1 and 2. And the Jewish people. Read Romans 3. And what's the solution? Father the faith, uh, follow rather the faith of Abraham. Romans 4. And know that God is freely extending mercy as a gift to all. And all who turn from their sin and receive that gift will experience salvation. How does this relate to you and I today? Do you know what it is to be rescued? That's the first question. And did you realize that God rescues us one at a time, just like those miners were rescued in that pod? One at a time. The scripture says about Jesus, he'll leave the 99 sheep behind so he can go find the one. Because he wants that one with him. Has Christ been calling your name? Have you said yes to the shepherd? He wants you with him. It's why he came. It's why he died on the cross. It's why he rose again. He wants you with him. This rescue plan continues to unfold. The end is not yet here, but the time is short. You look at our world today and ask yourself a question. If this keeps going, the direction it's going, not a lot of time, is there? It just continues to spiral. And so time is short. Those miners had an old, only so much time before they could rescue them, and then it was past that time. It was all over. It's, it's an apt description, isn't it? That the very Son of God left heaven to come to earth and become, if you will, that rescue pod to say, hold on to me, and I'll take you to the Father. And that invitation is freely given today in the same way it was then, and so it is now. The point is, do you believe? 
And for those of us that have experienced what it is to have Jesus wrap his arms around us and grant us the gift of salvation and forgiveness and what that is, what's going on in your hearts? Would you feel like some of those miners' families when they showed up alive? Christ has caused us to be born again and to have life that's eternal. And do we celebrate that with others? And do we freely share that news with others? This is good news. I'm not putting religion down someone's throat. I'm just telling you that God's loved you so much that he's done, moved heaven and earth so that you could be with him. Are you willing to say yes to him? You and I have a responsibility to share that. We live in a, whole, uh, in a world today, yes, I know an election happened last week. Do you think that's more hopeful today? I don't think so. If you're putting your hope in people. But if you put your hope in Christ, who's on the throne of heaven and earth, and rules and reigns, that's hope. And that's where it sets. As our worship team comes this morning, I, just, I want you to stop and I, I want you to think about this again this morning. Lord, have I heard your voice? Have I responded? Maybe I'm still on this journey. That's okay. Christ is inviting you to take that journey with him and come to a place of faith. I want us to stop and think about what that really looks like and what that means. And for you and I that live in our, in our community here in Billings, Montana, understand that there are wonderful Jewish people that are still needing Messiah just as much as the rest of us need the Messiah. It's true. First the Jew, then the Gentile. We all need the same, don't we? We need Christ. May we live in a way that bears witness to him and points people to him.